You are now listening to Troubles of Bruin, the Boston Bruins podcast that'll try and keep you level-headed while everybody else tries to get your hopes up. I'm Brandon Cherokee, and I'm joined, as always, by the wonderful Joseph Oaks. How's it going, Joe? Ow! So you just... Ow! You good? Ow! Speaking of level-headed, how's that for level-headed? I don't want to keep anybody level-headed. I'm getting you <laughs> jacked up. It's trade deadline season. Let's get jacked up, baby. Yeah, but jacked up in a realistic sense. Let's not have everybody thinking the Bruins are going to trade for Carlson and then also swing a trade for OEL and then also go and get Tavares. Yeah, you could. I mean, you can get jacked up without doing crank. Well, that's you what know? I was you talking don't, about. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to be smoking rocks to get jacked up, man. Tell you can to, just get pumped. Tell that to Boston Twitter. <laughs> Boston Twitter reg- regularly has regularly has some some biker gang crank coursing through its veins. <laughs> it's just just insanity. Uh, hi everybody, hello, hello, welcome, welcome to Troubles of Bruin, the Boston Bruins podcast, where we start by talking about uh, dirty biker gang drugs. <laughs> Well, uh, one of us is Joe, and one of us is Straight Edge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of us has a very checkered history, and one of us is a very polite Straight Edge Canadian. We'll we'll let you guess who's who. Yeah, very polite. No, it's true though. <laughs> All right, so uh, what do you want to get started oh, with? So- today? Oh, so- sorry, eh? Oh, did I interrupt your uh, crack smoking time? Oh, I'm sorry about that, eh? I didn't mean to. Please, <laughs> uh, as as you were, please, yeah, get comfortable. Smoke crack in my house. That's yeah. okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Joe, but we should get started with the podcast. You see what I did there? Do we have to? <laughs> no. I'm having, a, I'm having a good time just kind of talking. Do we have to talk about hockey today? I mean, one day we could just have a regular podcast where we just talk. Who needs to talk about the Bruins, right? It's not like everybody yeah. listening wants to hear about the Bruins. Come on. People aren't tuning into this podcast to listen about hockey, are they? I mean, I don't really know, to be honest. Couldn't tell you. All right. Well, speaking of hockey, actually, let, let me just really quickly. I've been watching, uh, watching the Olympics, obviously, because the Olympics are going on right now. And, uh, and I, you know, I've, I've caught more women's hockey than I have men's hockey to this point. Yep. Uh, first of all, that, that USA Canada game was fantastic. What a great game. What a great rivalry. Um, I, it's a shame I don't get to watch those two teams play more often because what a blast that is. Am I right? Yeah, no, Canada and U.S. hockey. I think we talked about, um, favorite hockey games, uh, like five episodes ago or something. And I remember I was saying Canada versus U.S., the women. For the gold medal in 2014, and that was oh, one of my game. favorite games ever. So I, I've always loved this rivalry. It's always good, and yeah, I mean, despite the streak that Canada's on with never losing a game ever, apparently, uh, those two teams oh. always put up a good matchup. I know, I know. USA just it's it seems like it's Canada's definitely the best team in the world, and USA is number two. They've they've proved that time and again, but. Um, but you got to figure that it's starting to get into the the heads of Team USA a little bit too at this point. That just like no matter no matter what they do, they just can't beat Canada. No matter what, they cough up leads. They can't quite you know overcome early deficits. It's like no matter how they play Canada, they wind up losing. Yeah, I mean yesterday they took forty five shots on net and they have a, a goalie playing at her first Olympics and she stops forty four of them. You know, and it's hard for me sometimes to watch the. Uh, like the U.S. hockey team, because there's so many players on the team that I watch in the NWHL, and I love, obviously. And then I'm like, I can't cheer for you right now because you're playing. I mean, you're the direct competition to Canada, so I can't. Yeah, be like, I can't cheer Hillary Knight, for example, who's one of my five favorite hockey players on the planet. You know, she can play. Yeah, it's that's how I feel uh, when international hockey rolls around, and I find myself rooting against Patrice Bergeron. It's like, oh man, this sucks. I don't want to do. That. I don't want to root against that guy. That guy's awesome and really good. Well, that whenever <laughs> people not- talk about Bergeron, they're like, oh yeah, he's good. He has the selkies. He has this. He's got the faceoffs. He has two gold medals. Most people that are saying that are Bruins fans. I'm one of the few people that can say it and think I got to enjoy all of that. It wasn't like a segmented yeah. part. You even got to enjoy the. Oh, you're probably a little too young to remember the World Junior, huh? No, I, I saw it. That was a oh, crazy yeah? squad. That was when there was the yeah. lockout, so he was able to come back and play. Yeah. So what, what? one thing that really stood out to me about about women's hockey at the Olympics is that the 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 dis, the the I'm sorry, I just had like an aneurysm. I just, <laughs> I just I it's all the crank. Just, <laughs> it's all the it's all the it's all the crank and coffee in my system right now. Um, <laughs> there there used to be a significant difference in terms of the style of play between men's hockey and women's hockey. And I got to say, watching the USA-Canada women's game, that was that was 
like watching an NHL game from a physical physicality standpoint. And I mean that both in terms of USA Canada games always get a little chippy, but it's also not necessarily in an indictment, but you know, it, it shows you how quickly the physical aspects of the game has started to evaporate from the NHL. You know, I, there was just so it doesn't get a little too skewed with a USA Canada lens you know, I was watching the Japan Switzerland women's game, and that wasn't much less physical than a typical NHL game at this point either. Yeah, um, it re- the the game has really, really started to take on an international tournament feel to it. The NHL is starting to resemble the Olympics in terms of you know just speed and skill. And like, let's keep the chippiness and the and the 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 bone crunching hits out of the game as much as possible. I, I for the record, I'm not complaining about that. I, I know that in the past I have talked about, you know, I've lamented rather, um, you know, the the disappearance of of fighting in the NHL, and I certainly do miss it. But I I wouldn't trade the way that this Boston Bruins team is playing to start carrying around a couple more fourth line thugs, you know, I like, I like having the best record in the NHL and having, uh, you know, 15 guys on the team who can put the puck in the net. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, I think that's the most important thing too, is you have a team that they don't all hit, but they're not afraid to hit if they need to. But uh, I mean, we've talked about it before too. You mentioned it earlier to me that there's only a few players on the team that'll actually finish every one of their, uh, their hits, right? They're not going to lay out a check every time they can. But at the same time, when they need to, they do. And when they don't, it's probably because there's a better play that can happen. So it's it's interesting. Yep. It's not like they like a Jimmy Hayes, that nothing against Jimmy Hayes. We've talked about it before. You know, we have no issue with Jimmy Hayes as a person. But he didn't finish his hits. And then if you're not, if you're going to leave a check on the uh, on the table and then not do anything yeah. uh, productive out of the play, then what are you doing on the team? Or yeah, okay, when, you're, when you're when you're when you're six six, two hundred and thirty pounds, you've got one goal in your last seven hundred games, and you you better you better start finishing your checks, man. <laughs> yeah, and I mean that goes. I mean, if you're six six, obviously this should be not you know you shouldn't be a, a brawler, uh, so to speak. But I mean, you should be able oh, to I, lay a hit. I I I disagree. You if you're six six, you got to either be Mario Lemieux or you got to be Bob Prober. You got to pick. <laughs> if you if you if you're if you're six foot six but you can score forty goals a year, then you don't have to hit anybody. And right. if you're six foot six and you couldn't put the puck in the ocean from the wet sand, you know you better start beating the shit out of people. Well, that's what I'm saying. You should if you can if you're six six and you want to be more of a skilled hockey player, that's fine. But if you're five eleven, if you're six two, if you're you know if you're five nine, if you have a hit that's available to you, you have to lay the hit. You can't just say, well, you know, I don't want to make a hit and then. And it's also, the bad part about laying and finishing out your checks now is there's so many fights that break out because of a clean hit. And that's, this, yeah. it's awful. Well, I mean, you gotta, you gotta figure, there's, there's nothing wrong with letting the other team take an instigator penalty. You know, right. if, you have, if, if, you have, if you have a clean hit and if you can follow through with the act and, and keep it a clean hit and somebody wants to jump you and try to start a fight, then, you know, let them. Let them jump you and start a fight, and you can either, you know, fight back, or you can, you know, cover up and turtle and let them take the penalty. And you know, I wouldn't let another team's retaliation discourage me from doing something I wanted to do that was within right. the rules. But, um, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. For, personally, I, I loved, I loved the hitting part of the game when I played. I'm not a particularly big guy either. I'm not, I'm not little, but. You know, I'm I'm six feet tall, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I I have never in my life weighed more than 180 pounds. Uh, well, I'm not fire. exactly uh, I'm not exactly a big guy, but uh, but man, if I had a chance to to hit somebody, I took it. You know, if I already had two or three goals in the game and I got a chance to line somebody up, I wanted to do it because it was fun. Yeah, it also it makes people think, right? If you're going to hit them in the corner when they're trying to unload the puck, let's say you know they're behind their own blue line. Uh, their own yeah. goal line, sorry, and they're trying to get the pass behind their net. If they know you're coming every single time, it's going to make them make a mistake. We've talked about it before. Oh, geez, the la- the last two times I had to retreat to chase a puck down into my own zone, I got fucking nailed. I'm going to hot potato this thing and get it off of my stick as quickly as I can. Yeah, absolutely. It's and- not just about – it's not It's not personal. It's not just about, like, hitting people is cool. I mean, it's the, there is there is a schematic advantage 
when when you are dominating another team physically. They start to make mistakes because of it. But this Bruins team, like you said, they've managed to really do a nice job of walking that line between being physical when they need to be, but also not taking themselves out of play out of a play and not taking an unnecessary penalty and leaving their team shorthanded when they don't need to. And their their record shows. Yeah, I mean, I was watching Montreal, Arizona yesterday because I hate my life, apparently. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there was one play, and it was nothing special, and nothing came about it. But it was a play where Montreal had the defenseman pinch in the zone. So they were going up towards the goal for, uh, for a shot on net, missed the puck. But as he's skating up... Brendan Gallagher, instead of, and he's the most like heart, uh, you know, heart and soul player on the team. He never takes a shift off. But I saw when he was back uh, checking to get back to the uh, to cover the defenseman, it was the slowest transition ever. And in that time, if they get an odd man break, that's a goal. You see Boston; it's hustle every single time. If if McAvoy pinches, Bergeron's back covering, Pashnek's back covering. I know Pashnek's had trouble recently, but you know what I'm talking about. Like the players are tw- all twelve yeah. forwards will to a man. Yeah. It's perfect. I mean, look at look at what look at the transformation that Ryan Spooner has undergone. And I don't even just mean like from an from an offensive statistical standpoint. I mean, look at how hard he is on pucks. It was a he preseason looked, Ryan Spooner. Yeah, he looks like he looks like a a, a different player. He yeah. looks like I don't I don't know if this was a matter of I'm sure that a, a, a lot of people will immediately point to coaching as being the culprit and maybe they're right. I mean, you know, it's Ryan Spooner di- Ryan Ryan Spooner didn't look like this Ryan Spooner for the last 27 games of the regular season with Bruce Cassidy last year. Right. And he didn't look like this player when Bruce Cassidy was making him a healthy scratch in the playoffs. So, maybe it's Cassidy, maybe it's not Cassidy. Maybe it's Ryan Spooner realizing that this is his last chance to kind of cash in on a good contract. I I don't know. I I won't I won't I won't pretend to know what's going on in Ryan Spooner's head, but the guy that's on the ice this year wearing number 51 in the black and gold is a completely different player. And this guy looks like the guy that you might want to extend. I I, I can't believe I'm saying that. (laughs) It's true. I wrote, I wrote an article early in the season about what the Bruins could get for Ryan Spooner. I wrote an article in the off season talking about how Ryan Spooner's time was up and how the Bruins should try to swap him out for a different restricted free agent. And and here I am in February talking about how the Bruins should consider extending Ryan Spooner. Consider extending Ryan Spooner. Well, the thing with Spooner is you've always known he had speed and skill, but he never really showed it. Now he's not going... It's kind of like Joe Kelly on the Red Sox, where the guy can throw 100, he can throw gas, no problem, but it's the off-speed pitches that are also important. So when Ryan Spooner catches you flat-footed and then bursts by you because you didn't expect him to speed up like that, that's the important part. It's when he can catch you with the, the, uh, the acceleration, and then you see him shooting more from the half wall, you see him laying hits a little more not a lot of hits obviously he's not a big hitter that's not ryan spooner's game but he's but but he but he finishes his checks i've watched him plant a couple guys this year already yep absolutely and like i said he's just he's he's, he's playing does he's playing decisive hockey everything he's doing he is doing decisively the tentative nature of his game is gone that's i think that's exactly what the uh the difference has been you're right it's the fact that he's not halfway in between well should I pinch up and go for a breakaway should I lay a hit out should I back no it's okay I'm gonna lay this hit then I'm gonna go back here and Krejci is gonna be there and ready for me it's it's decisive like you said and that's what we saw in 2011 when you had the two lines of just excellence you know you had Bergeron and Marchand that duo unstoppable but you also had Krejci Horton and Lucic until obviously uh, Horton got hurt but you had just decisiveness and chemistry and the eyes around, not just in the back of their head, in every single part of their head, they could see where anybody was at any given time. And having that decisiveness is important when you're trying to win games. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Hey, speaking of the Olympics, before we get just too far off base, uh, can we talk about Ryan Donato really quickly? Nah. Nah, all right, never mind. We'll, we'll skip So let's that. go back. To, yeah, Ryan Donato, man. <laughs> He's something so I, special. I, I talked. I I was on the phone with my dad yesterday. Uh, we we had a, an hour plus long conversation. Probably about half of that was about the Bruins. Okay. And uh, my my dad knows hockey. I mean, ever I know I'm a hockey guy because of my dad. He was he was my coach. My dad's a hockey guy. Okay. But my dad is also like in his sixties and works a full time job. 
and doesn't exactly have the time to stay completely in the loop with all of the prospects that the Bruins have. Right. Which is fair. I I wouldn't expect the casual fan to know all of them. He's he's more than a casual fan. I mean, he knows if if they're on the Bruins, he knows all about them. But no, but, but I meant the prospect pool is it's tough. Yeah. You know, like if you like the NHL, that's one thing. But to know what's coming up next, there's a lot of people that don't know that. Yeah, I mean, he's got he's got three kids. He's got a full time job. He's in his sixties. You know, like he's 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 a busy guy. Yeah. Um. So I was talking to him about about Ryan Donato and extolling the virtues of Ryan Donato, and I told him, you know, like no, you know, he's on the Olympic team, but you know, keep in mind this is this is kind of elevated competition for Ryan Donato. It's not exactly <laughs> the jump to the NHL, but you know, I was like, he's he's playing tonight. You know, to watch the game. You know, get a get a feel for Ryan Donato. You know, like keep in mind he's playing in you know against elevated Tempering competition. Expectation. Yeah, temper your expectations, and here's Ryan Donato scoring both of Team USA's goals. And two, nice one goals, win. too. A snipe, and then both. the second was a beauty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No big no big deal. Yeah. Just just Ryan Donato just doing what he does, just scoring goals. It's uh, I saw some people trying to compare it to Anders Bjork, and then with Anders Bjork, you then get uh, Danton Heinen comparisons, where is he ready to make the jump to the NHL? I don't think Donato is either of those players. You know, I think no, Donato, I don't either. He's so skilled and he's so smart. That's what when they drafted him, they knew he was really good offensively, but they knew he was smart. That was the most important thing. I mean, being honestly, you know, the fact that his name is Donato has something to do with it. I'm sure he's yeah. He's not not only did his father play in the NHL, but he's also the coach's son. He's got both of those things working for his benefit. He's got the DNA and he's got the pedigree. His whole life, he has been. He has received one-on-one tutelage from a former Olympian and NHLer. Also, you go to Harvard. You don't just go to Harvard because you know you can play hockey. You have to be smart to some extent to get into Harvard, regardless. Like you're yeah. academically, you still have to be not as smart as the other people that aren't there because of their uh, their sports. But there's athletics no, don't there's, get you, you know, in. There's no knuckleheads at Harvard. You yeah. know, there are knuckleheads at Yale, but there are no <laughs> knuckleheads at Harvard. Athletics don't get you in exclusively. You know. Right. Unless LeBron yeah. James is, you know, 18 and says, I'm going there and I don't care how smart I am, like, you let me play. Then, yeah, I think they're going to let him play basketball there, you know, when he's 18. Yeah, but he still wouldn't get a full ride because Ivy League schools don't offer full rides. Right. Um, but, you know, as far as Donato making the jump, you know, it's something that we have touched on both, you know, here on the podcast and in our writings. Uh, that's kind of the rumor that just won't go away. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a believer in where there's smoke, there's fire. But at the same time, I have a really hard time envisioning the, the coach's son giving, giving the thumbs up on his, on his, uh, or the coach rather, giving the thumbs up to his son on bailing on his team midseason. Uh, it's hard, you know, because then what is it? I mean, it's fine if you want to say, well, I'm doing what's right for my son or for my player. It's great. But the rest of the team, you have to explain to them, hey, I was okay with this. Because you're still the coach of those guys. You still have to tell them, hey, we're going to play now. We aren't doing great with him. So now let's, you know, let's see what we can do without him. I don't know about how that would, the conversation would be an I, interesting one, I think. And, and and especially considering the fact that, you know, last year, Harvard was a was a much better team. They yeah. had a, a little bit more of a veteran presence last year. They had guys like Alex Kerfoot on the team. Um, you know, they won the Bean Pot. They they won the you know they they won the Bean Pot. They made it to the Frozen Four this year. Harvard is like kind of a five hundred team. I think they're a game or two above five hundred right now. Um, so they're more middle of the pack. So their their season isn't going to go into April. You know, it doesn't. It it looks like even if they make the NCAA tournament, they're probably going to be an early out. That still gives Ryan Donato, you know, seven or eight games. I think uh, of of the NHL at the end of the season. If if burning a year off his contract is is in the cards, um, you know, he doesn't have to leave after the Olympics. Yeah, that's another. He can still finish his season off. You're right. He could still finish the regular season in Boston and then be a part of their playoff roster if that's part if that's the plan. But the one thing that confuses me is when people say, "Well, yeah, he's going to join and it's going to be a boost to the lineup." 
But who do you take out of the lineup? Where you, does he play? You know that you're not taking out any of the top six, right? Spooner isn't being removed from that line for Ryan Donato at this point. That would make no sense. Neither's the brusque. Right. He's not he's he's not gonna go play in the third line either because that's too valuable a checking line for the Bruins. The, the their third line is a huge part of why Patrice Bergeron has twenty seven goals right now. But because then, he doesn't have to take every defensive zone face off. But then people also well also the fourth line does that as well, which is impressive. But yeah. people talk about well you trade Riley Nash while he has value and then you slot in uh, Donato in the third line role. Oh. That's that's all fine and, and dandy if it works, but what if this it doesn't is- work? You know, this we're saying he is, looks like he's going to be yeah, a good this player. Yeah, this isn't EA Sports, you know. This isn't PlayStation hockey. This is this is the NHL. You don't trade guys like Riley Nash right before the playoffs. Guys like Riley Nash are the reason why teams win Stanley Cups. You trade to get them. I don't know if people remember, you know, a guy named Rich Peverly or a guy named Chris Kelly. But, you Chris know. Ke- yeah, <laughs> yeah, guys like that. Or how about what Max Talbot did with the Penguins? I mean, even with the Bruins, he was such a good, like, uh, a plug to have. Not a plug, that's a yeah. bad word, but... Uh, he was a spark plug. He was able to go on any he line that you needed him to. Yeah, he didn't get the benefit of getting to play on a playoff-bound Bruins team. But, you know, those guys, those those are the guys who whose true value shines in, in the playoffs. Come playoff time, the guys who do all the little things when every single face-off matters, yeah. when every single blocked shot or, you know, deflection into the stands matters. You know, guys like Riley Nash, that's when you really see their value to a team. You don't trade guys like that right before the playoffs start. Riley Nash and Tim Schaller are two interesting players, not to get too sidetracked from Donato, but they're two players that it's hard to see them re-signing with the Bruins if you consider the fact that uh, there's so many prospects still coming up and you have to figure, like, you don't want to pay too much for a third and a fourth-line player. Riley Nash is a fourth-line player playing on the third line. That being said, yep. I, th- I think he can play a third-line role on 31 teams, and he's proving it on the best team, you know? R- Riley Nash is, is Chris Kelly 2.0. Yeah, he's he can play third-line minutes, but can you imagine on the fourth line what he'd be doing? Yeah, but we, yeah, I mean, you know, go ahead, continue. It's when You talk about, like, well, they're going to probably be gone next season. Pro- I would say not probably, but they could be gone, realistically. Like, if they're gone, you're I, not going to bat an eye. I think... W- I think one of them is definitely gone next season. And it's not because the Bruins are just going to shoo them out the door. It's a lot of it has to do with the fact that both of those guys are having career years, you know, falling in love with falling in love with your bottom six forwards and overpaying to keep them is that's a that's a hallmark Peter Shirelli move. Yep. You know, that's how Chris Kelly wound up with a three million dollar a year contract. Riley Nash is having easily the best statistical season of his career He's probably not going to approach these offensive numbers again. They're probably going to lead him to receiving a, a bigger contract than he's ever gotten before. You can keep one of Riley Nash or Tim Schaller, but the Bruins won't keep both of them. If Riley Nash gets two two and a half million dollars a year, I wouldn't be surprised by from another team. You know, I wouldn't either. And and to be honest with you, I think two million dollars a year in in the modern NHL is a little bit of an overpayment, especially. If you're an organization like the Bruins that has more talented players than you have roster spots. Yeah. But then that's another example, too, then. Something else that I saw today, and I'll write about it next week. I already mentioned on Twitter. Austin Zarnick, if he doesn't play another 21 games with the Bruins this year, he becomes an unrestricted free agent. Does he really? So does that mean that he gets... I mean, he's not going to be called back up, I wouldn't assume. Well, then well then you got to trade him. That's what I was thinking. And then, I mean, you don't just trade Zarnik for like a fourth. You trade Zarnik as part of a bigger package. As part of a bigger package, exactly. Maybe, you know, maybe a team that is, uh, you know, in, in the rebuilding phases and officially sellers, maybe a team like the New York Rangers would be interested in a guy like Austin Zarnik. Young, talented, skill forward. He's a, an advanced metrics darling. Um, every single time he's been called up to the NHL, his Corsi and Fenwick numbers have been stellar. Uh, he, I'm he not. A, I'm not good. a. Yeah, I mean, he's he. That's the thing. He is a good player. He's a he's a good hockey player who's just a victim of the numbers game in Boston right now. So if the Bruins were trying to go after a guy like, uh, like Grabner, for instance, or, or even a Nick Holden, or even a Nick Holden. I mean, maybe a, maybe an Austin Zarnick for Nick Holden straight up swap. And it sounds like it's a bad trade for the Bruins when you consider the fact that Holden isn't a really good defenseman and Zarnik has potential to be a good player. But That's you've got to think depth, about your baby. need. Exactly. You've got to think of your need now. And this team, as much as it pains me to say this, you can't only look at the future. Like You, you really can't. Bergeron isn't going to have this kind of a year 
for the next five years. Krejci's not going to have a great, you know, next five years. It's going to be good. The, the, the future is unwritten. You can't just assume that the Bruins are perennial contenders from here on out because they've got a lot of really good prospects. You have to go for it when you can. And when you have so many prospects, you're allowed to overpay a little bit. That being said, when it comes to a trade like the McDonough cost, I mean, you first you hear, oh. you hear uh, Kevin Paul Dubon talk about Carlo, Frederick, and a first, and maybe another pick, I think he said, would get it done. That's you don't yeah, trade get, away Carlo yeah. and a, a top prospect. That's that's get f- get fucked. Are you are you kidding me? Ca- and, Carlo, Frederick, a first round pick and another prospect. Ryan McDonough is a good defenseman. I get it, but go fuck yourself. And like, then you hear like they might want they, they want DeBrusque in any trade. Like that doesn't help the Bruins. You know you. But here's here's the thing. That's I mean, and this is we were talking about this earlier, but this is. This is an instance of the Bruins doing their due diligence and making phone calls because that's that's Don Sweeney's job this time of year. Yeah, you call you call calls. all thirty GMs that are, you know your counterparts. You say, "Hey, what would it cost to get this guy?" Someone, I guarantee you, they've had twenty conversations about players we're not even thinking about. You know, yeah, players that of, that shouldn't even of, be available. Sure, and 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 of course, the Rangers are going to ask for the moon for McDonough because he's a a top pairing defenseman and b. He's got another year left on his contract. The the Rangers don't have to they don't have to trade McDonough. They're under no obligation to trade him. This isn't like an instance of things go into the wire at the deadline and the Rangers eventually relenting and lowering their prices. They don't have to. No, they don't, of they're not they going to lose him for nothing. So they can ask for the moon. But, you know, everybody on the internet losing their mind about like taking that that request with any degree of sincerity like Don Sweeney would actually pull the trigger on that trade like just everybody just take a deep breath smoke some crank and <laughs> and just you know and and just relax i know crank doesn't make you relax but i i couldn't resist the callback uh we've got to have uh, like 10 of them for sure calm calm down you know just because that's what the rangers want doesn't mean that that's what don sweeney's going to spend and that's you know? also, I mean, the DeBrus thing was the actual want. The other thing was a Bruins beat writer talking about what should or might get it done. That wasn't like, it wasn't like a New York writer saying this is the asking price. It was a Bruins guy speculating, hey, this is probably something that it would cost. And I think, realistically, he might not have even been saying this is the kind of, uh, like, these players are the ones they're asking for. He might have been saying this is the kind of package, like, this is what it would look like. Something similar to this. A good roster player who's young, well, a good prospect yeah. who's young, obviously, and a first-round pick. That's I don't think that's anywhere near what the asking price should be. I understand he's got a uh, term on his contract, but that's absurd. Like, that's absolutely absurd. Yeah, and that's also, like, that level of prognostication, like, that's an educated guess. You know, like, I, I understand that I understand that DuPont's been working for the Globe for 80 years now, but, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, it wasn't that long ago that everybody on the internet, you know, Boston Globe writers included, were saying that there was no way that the Bruins were getting David Pasternak for less than $7.5 million a year. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, think, things seldom unfold the way that everybody on the internet suggests they're going to unfold you know this happens every trade deadline everybody loses their minds talking about like oh so and so is going there and you know i can connect the dots you can connect the dots anybody can can marry a team's surplus with another team's wants or needs um but things, like I said, seldom unfold the way that we expect them to. Just because Ryan McDonough is really good and on the market, and just because the Bruins have a really good team and a really full pipeline, doesn't mean that a trade is imminent. It was like three years ago that I talked about this is where the Bruins really needed... Uh... I'm going to let that ring so it doesn't interrupt us. Brandon, I just sometimes... Your lack of professionalism during the recording of this podcast astonishes me. As if any of this is going to actually go through to the final product. <laughs> You're going to edit this out? Of course I am. <laughs> you, 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 you snake in the grass scumbag. I think you should keep this, including the part where I, where I berate you for, for the phone ringing in the background. I, think, I, guess, I, think, I guess you'll have to listen to the podcast to see if it does. I think, I think the listeners will really appreciate this. If you are listening to this um, then, then that means that I was able to coerce Brandon into uh, including <laughs> his professionalism as well as uh, as my verbal beatdown uh, into the recording of this. Podcast. Yeah, he's going to try and coerce. Fingers and, crossed. He's going to try and coerce and peer pressure the straight edge agnostic kid. <laughs> yeah.
Come on, you wimp. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> a couple of years ago, Ryan McDonough. No, a couple of years ago, I was talking about the uh, the Bruins and how they, obviously their defense was awful and how Nashville Terrible. had a surplus of defense. I really wanted Ryan Ellis or Matisse Ekholm before anyone knew who they were. And now look at them. Everyone knows who they are, you know? Roman Yossi, yeah. Shea Weber at the time. I, I said Weber wasn't realistic. Yossi wasn't going anywhere. But Ellis and, and Ekholm would be really realistic. Uh, partners. I, 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 for the record, I, I really like Matthias Ekholm. Me too. I, I, I like I like his game. He's he's you know he's a Swedish defenseman in every sense of the word, but he plays with a little bit of nasty too. You know, he would be best case scenario, which you would hope Brandon Carlo could be. I don't think he'll ever be that, but best case scenario, he gets to the point where he's that kind of shut down physical oh, defenseman. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say that Matthias Ekholm is 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 out of Brandon Carlo's stratosphere. You know, I know that you're not one of the one of the the masses who who you know just seize upon any opportunity to talk shit about Brandon Carlo simply because he's not Charlie McAvoy. No, I love but, Carlo. But you know, I mean, Brandon Carlo, this guy was a second round pick like two and a half years ago, and he's already got almost two full seasons of the NHL under his belt as a top four defenseman. I mean, you he's say 21. almost two, it's because he's in the middle of his second one. You know? Yeah, he's. I mean, he's. He's a top four defenseman already. He, uh, I mean, he's a second pairing defenseman. Make make no mistake about that. He's not a top pairing guy yet, but no, he doesn't have to be. He's, I mean, he's twenty one years old. He's playing solid minutes on the Bruins second pairing. He's a great defensive defenseman. And and think about this: in a couple of years, Zdeno Char is going to be gone. Kevin Miller is going to be gone. Adam McQuaid's going to be gone. Who's going to kill penalties in Boston? <laughs> no one talks about that part of it, right? You're going to have, you all, know, Lozon. All, all of these, all, yeah, all of the Bruins penalty killing defensemen are going to be gone by then. And all that's going to be left is Brandon Carlo. No, well, he's going to be traded for Rick Nash, so obviously not. Oh, yeah, no, I forgot. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to trade Brandon Carlo, seven first round picks, Jake DeBrusque, and, uh, and uh, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Or Ryan Fitzgerald, rather, uh, for Michael Grabner. I forgot. Yeah, a lot of lots of Ryan's in professional sports that go to Harvard. Too many, too many damn Ryan's in the, in New England. This is <laughs> and Davis in the, Boston. It's a lot of Davis. I, sw- I swear to God, the the Irish are the Irish remain a blight on New England. On New England, <laughs> just too a many, blight. too many damn Ryan's. Too many Fitzgeralds and McAvoys, and just too too many damn <laughs> Irishmen. But uh, when you're talking about a trade, like a, a big trade, if you want to make one, you're going to have to spend, and that's okay because the prospect pool is so deep. But you also don't, you sh- if a team doesn't make a trade, don't be like Celtics fans were for probably two, three, four years where they complained about Danny Ainge and he never makes a big trade and he's not doing anything. And then the last two years, he makes all these huge moves and gets all these great players. People complain when he drafted Jalen Brown third overall and that everyone loves Jalen Brown and is untouchable. People were mad when he traded the first overall pick and then he gets Jason Tatum and everyone's like, no, Jason Tatum's untouchable. You know, he gets he gets J- he gets Jason Tatum, J- and you know not only that, but he somehow has the foresight to recognize that Markel Fultz can't shoot. Yeah, and no uh, trades trades back, picks up an extra first round pick, gets arguably probably the best player in this past year's draft, and now that guy is immediately untouchable too. And then when he makes that trade, the initial first round trade, he also gives himself room to make the trade to get Kyrie Irving. So now people are talking about Danny Ainge is the best GM in the league. Don't complain about Sweeney right now as he's still in this, what, third year on the team? Come on. You have to let him make the moves. He's built up to get to this point. So if he trades away a ton of prospects and goes for a huge splash, I'm not going to bat an eye. If he makes no move, I'm not going to bat an eye. You have to trust them at some point. You don't have to have an opinion on every move. or not. You can have an opinion, but you, you don't have, have an opinion. to freak it out about it. It just doesn't make move. it right. <laughs> well, you, you have to wait for it to play out. And if it doesn't play out, I mean, uh, Ty Anderson just said it. He doesn't want to trade for Rick Nash. I don't think he actually doesn't want to, but the way he said it was, he doesn't want to make a trade because he's, he doesn't want to have to think about the next few years of having to deal with Bruins fans talking about like a, a one goal, three assist, and twelve game run for. Yeah, Rick Nash. I, I saw that, and I mean, and let's be honest, like that's not out of the cards for a Rick Nash playoff run, or anybody, you know, guy, you know? or anybody, anybody for that. that matter. I mean, look at look at what Yager did when when the Bruins brought Yager in. I know he picked up ten assists, which you know is fine. Um, but you know, he played 22 games in the playoffs. He didn't score a single goal. Uh, you and know, that made and me the sad. Bruins, 
because he never the, did the, a salute in the regular season. So then he said he's, he wanted to do it in meaningful hockey in the playoffs, and he never got the goal. And Yager's one of my probably my favorite player of all time. So not seeing him do the salute made me so sad. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I it, it, it you know going back to you know guys guys disappearing come playoff time, you know that's. That's why, you know, I also don't want to see the Bruins go after Rick Nash because, you know, I don't think the Bruins need Rick Nash. I don't think the Bruins need anything. If the Bruins are are going after a, a rental type of guy, a, a top nine forward, uh, I, I'm on record as, as saying that I want it to be Michael Grabner just because the, the, the myriad of ways that Michael Grabner can have an impact on a game, um, not to mention his, you know, greatly – is significantly smaller cost than than Rick Nash or Evander Kane or any of those Both guys. Both in cap hit and in terms of assets. E- exactly. You know the the name of the game for these Bruins. Look, I mean they're based on point percentage, they're the best team in the NHL. And you could make the case that all around they're the best team in the NHL top to bottom. It's it's a I legitimate would. case at least ever since mid November. Yeah. You know, and that's the majority the, of the season. That's a that's a lot of the season. The last three months, the Bruins are easily the best team in the NHL, both in terms of their level of play and their record. So I don't the, the, the Bruins don't need to bring in a savior. They don't need a Ryan McDonough. They don't need a Rick Nash. They don't need somebody who's going to come in and just immediately bump somebody out of a spot. But what they do need is depth. They need to make sure that the Bruins don't. They they, they need to make sure that they don't wind up in a position where. Paul Postma is playing multiple playoff games. They need to make sure that they're in a position where any one of their rookies who starts to struggle in the playoffs, which is going to happen, they need to make sure that that those struggles are coming from a position in the lineup that aren't completely detrimental to the team's success. Which is why I'm 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 so gung ho on Grabner because you could put Grabner on the second line, you could put him on the third line, you could put him on the fourth line, you can put him wherever he's the best. If Pasternak struggles, you can put him on the first line if you want to. I don't see why you would, but you could. Yeah, exactly. I mean that's that's why. Look, if it, like we said, you know, I, I really enjoyed that article you wrote. By the way, trying to explain like, look, it's okay to trade prospects, just. Just so long as you are not trading all of your prospects. And also make sure, like, you're allowed to make a trade, but as long as you think it's the right trade, I have no issue with it. If you think that drafting Sinitian and DeBrusque over Barzal is the right move, good, that's fine. I thought Barzal was the better player in that draft. But you know what? I'm not going to question it when you look at the success that Sweeney's had at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because, you know, it's been it's been going around today, Jim Matheson reporting that... You know the Rangers want Jake DeBrusque as part of as part of any deal for Ryan McDonough. But you know, and everybody and everybody's like, "Oh hell no, hell no! Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous!" And it's like, well, then you got to stop complaining about not drafting Matt Barzell now. <laughs> uh, and I wrote, I, I we talked about too the article where I had the Bruins trade for one of three depth defensemen or something like that. You know, one of those three type of players. I mentioned Nick Holden, yeah. uh, Michael Kempney, and Dennis Seidenberg. Dennis Seidenberg is and my sides. number one pick. I would love Seidenberg back, but. Uh, when I we talked about it, it was two weeks ago. We recorded the podcast and we talked about our ideal trade deadline piece. And you put me on the spot, and I said McDonough. And then it was immediately after that that everybody started talking about McDonough. And yeah. I was like, okay, so now that I started talking about these three players, let's see if one of these three players gets linked to Boston, and we'll see if I start the trend here. But uh, another player that just became available is Matt Hunwick. Apparently, he could be available. And former Bruin Matt Hunwick former Bruin, and you're talking about as an eighth defenseman. That's the thing. You can say these players aren't good players, but if they're an upgrade, not an upgrade over Paul Postma, but if you know they're more reliable because they've played games, you know, that's something you have to at least consider. And when you're talking about an eighth defenseman role, you can't really complain about who's sitting in that spot. If you could upgrade it, great. But if you don't have an upgrade there, it is what it is. But I haven't actually checked the comment section on that article, but I would love to see if anybody's complaining about one of those three players, because probably I specifically I mentioned gar- not having them in the lineup was the best situation, you know? Yeah. It's not about like, this is your new guy who's going to be hopefully starting game seven of the Stanley cup final. This is making sure that Tommy cross doesn't play another playoff game, you know, with, with all due respect to Tommy cross, you know, like Tommy cross, first of all, he's captain of the Providence Bruins. For a reason. He's been in the Oregon. He's been in the, the organization his whole career. He grew up the next town over from me, so I got that Connecticut love for Tommy Cross. But, you know, 
you don't want Tommy Cross starting a playoff game. That's just that's just if if you have designs on winning a Stanley Cup, then you need to make sure that guys like Tommy Cross and Zach Trotman aren't playing in a, in a in a meaningful April, May or June game, you know? Yeah. So a guy like Seidenberg, a guy like Nick Holden, uh, even a guy like Michael Kempney. Kempney, I, I look at Kempney as a, as like pretty much on par with Paul Postma. I see um, that, but potentially higher upside is why I would say it. Potentially. Because I know um, what he can do in terms of shot suppression and actual shot uh, production, and the guy is mm-hmm. he's so underrated. But I mentioned I, that he's I, not I, better than Postma, so to speak. I specifically mentioned that in the article, too. But yeah. I think he would be – at least he's an extra guy. You know, I like I like the idea of having somebody um, who's, you know, coming from a situation where they're like a guy like Nick Holden, who's playing like a four or five role with the Rangers right now. I love the idea of sliding him in as your new eighth defenseman. That's he's great playing. Depth. Unfortunately, he's playing like a two or three role in New York. It's crazy he's, how they use Nick Holden. He, yeah, he's he's playing way above his ceiling. That's like uh, uh, I Kevin mean, the, Miller. the same thing as. Yeah, Kevin Miller. I mean, except for last year when he played a second pairing role in the playoffs and was awesome. But yeah. you know, previously they were they were asking too much of Kevin Miller and he wasn't playing well and everybody hated him. And then the Bruins improved their depth a little bit and he went back to the bottom pairing and everybody was like, "Oh, Kevin Miller is actually pretty good." Yeah, everyone now is like, "I can't wait till Killer's back or I can't wait till McQuaid's back and we can never <laughs> trade this McQuaid guy." When they signed their contracts, Boston almost had like a, a Philadelphia level riot. Look, I'll, I'll be honest. I was one of those people who couldn't believe that the Bruins gave Kevin Miller four years, $10 million. Looks uh, like a steal I, now, I, though, right? But, it, of course, yeah. What a, what a great deal that is now. Kevin Miller, what, everything that he brings to the team, he's he's great. Yeah. I, uh, you, you compared know, like to Johnny said, Boychuk. Yep. Yeah, he is. He's, like a, he's, he's de- turning into a poor man's Johnny Boychuk. You know, Johnny Boychuk developed – slowly also he the, you know Johnny Boychuk was also a late bloomer he wasn't like this 22 year old who was Johnny Boychuk as we all remember him you know he was he was basically a career minor leaguer the guy had played 350 games in the AHL before he ever played regular NHL minutes you know yeah, Johnny Boychuk's and, in his 30s right now like he's not a young you know spring chicken here no no he's not uh so you know Kevin Miller uh he's 34 you know that's crazy Boychuk, yeah. So, you know, Nick Holden as your eighth defenseman, that's fantastic. Dennis Seidenberg, in addition to being, you know, a, a great story, you know, with Seidenberg coming home and, and probably finishing his career. I don't know if I don't know if he's got another contract on the table after this year. You know, obviously people are gonna gripe about, you know, acquiring a guy who's already counting for buyout money. Like I get that, but people are gonna gripe about anything. But at that point, um, if you're already it, who cares? It's, it's done anyway. You might as well just it, make the best it already of the situation. Happened. It already it already happened. So if you what's he making this year? A million dollars on, on one point two five, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that pro rated equates to nothing. Uh exactly. so if 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 Dennis Seidenberg becomes your new eighth defenseman and you wind up, you know, putting Dennis Seidenberg on the ice for two games during the playoffs. You know, the guy's a battle-tested veteran. You know, he's he's the kind of guy that you can go, you can put in a sheltered role on your bottom pair in the playoffs. Who's going to go out and block shots and lock down the other team? And you know, he's not going to be asked to to reprise his 2011 role. No, obviously not. Just just you know, to... it's, it. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, it, uh, for 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 the Bruins at this point at the deadline, it's it's a numbers game. It's about it's about making sure that in the playoffs you don't have to play anyone who has no business being on the ice during a playoff game. Exactly. It, it's that's about the making most sure. Thing. It's about making sure that Frank Vetrano isn't on the ice in the playoffs. It's about making sure that Paul Postma isn't on the ice during the playoffs. That's it. Yep. Whatever you got to do to fill out your run. Right. You don't have to go out and get a top-pairing defenseman. You don't have to go out and get a top-six forward. You just got to make sure that your playoff roster is comprised exclusively of guys who belong on a playoff roster. And it's rare that you look at a team and you think there's no room in the top-12 forwards or the top-six defense for a player from the outside to come in. And that's a really good thing. Yeah, look at, look at the 2013-14 the Bruins that won the President's Trophy. You know, this was a team that had the best record in the NHL during the regular season, 
And when the playoffs came around, they had Matt Fraser in the lineup. They had Justin Florek in the lineup. I love they Justin had Florek. Zach Trotman. <laughs> they had Zach Trotman and Joe Morrow playing playoff games. You know, it's it's no wonder why that team lost in the second round, despite the fact that they won the President's Trophy during the regular season. They had no depth. Yep. Just to uh, so you, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, it was a different topic. Well, or kind of going back to the last year, I was going to kind of. Uh, wrap up to kind of loose ends if i ask you what year johnny boychuk was drafted do you know you might know because you wrote a story about him and uh, miller but uh 2006 2002 2002 oh my god yeah he was a you know? he was a colorado avalanche draft pick yep 61st yep. overall but that gives you an idea of like he was an ahl player for a long time and then to go a, into a, the, a long time a long time yeah like it wasn't like he, he, he like even he guy. even played he even played a full season in the in the AHL in the Bruins organization. After spending years as part of the Colorado minor league system, he came over to Boston and then played a full year with Providence before he even got called up. Tanny Agostino, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, to go back to the comment section of the piece about depth. So one person commented, Bruins aren't looking for a 7th or 8th defenseman. They're looking for a top 4 defender. Well, I'm glad this guy knows oh, says, more than we According do. to who? <laughs> says the, this, this, the guy, guy, this guy, guy has no Don, This guy has Don Sweeney on speed dial, apparently. The guy has no profile picture, for what it's worth. <laughs> no! And Shocking. Somebody else says, if they're smart, they might look to get someone to move chair down a pairing. And then somebody else commented, sure, we wouldn't want to sell the farm or anything for a top pairing defenseman. Or would, sorry, we wouldn't have to. <laughs> smart thinking. And then another guy, This now remember, this is a piece talking about how the Bruins should trade for a player who can be their eighth defenseman. I'd love to see Eric Carlson as a Bruin. Yeah, I'd love to see Gordie Howe as a Bruin. Like, how are you commenting, I'd yeah, love to ma- see Eric Carlson, when the piece specifically says, let's trade for a depth defenseman. <laughs> yeah, Look, let's trade for a depth defenseman. I'd love to have the best defenseman in the NHL on, on, on our team. <laughs> Maybe the best player on the planet, you know? Like, but it's but it, it's funny that you bring up you bring up Carlson because I had mentioned something to you previously, where you know, looking at these the, at this this supposed alleged asking price for McDonough, like at that point, why not just throw in a first round pick and go after Carlson? Yeah, if you can get a trade you know, for Carlson I mean, done, that's a if, Stanley if, Cup. If, if you're already gutting your farm system and your future draft cachet, then then why not just throw in like an extra first-round pick and go after another great defenseman who's on a team moving in the wrong direction, who's got one year left on his contract after this year, you know? Yep, and I mean, that's because that cost would be just unreal. You know, like it's unrealistic. Yeah. Whatever the and, cost and, of and, McDonough and, might and be. And honestly, when when has that when has it ever worked out? Can oh, I, I'm I'm, I'm I'm actually asking when has when has moving heaven and earth and trading just a boatload of prospects and draft picks for one player when has that ever worked? Can you can you name one instance? I can go ahead and name times it didn't work. <laughs> Which yeah, is most exactly. Times. But but like I said, I'm not trying to be a dick about this. I'm not trying to prove a point. I am saying that I live and breathe hockey, and as I sit here right now, off the top of my head, I can't think of a single instance wherein a team traded a shitload of prospects and picks for one guy and had it be viewed as a good move in hindsight. Go look at the Alexi Ashton trade. Go look at the Peter Forsberg trade. Go look at I mean, all these trades are just atrocious. You look at it like Chara, a second overall pick that becomes Spezza, and there's more. There's a lot more to get Yashin, who did nothing, obviously. Yeah. But, so you got to yeah, be cautious so, when you talk about making a big trade because it's easy so, to say the player's great, but will they be great in your team? That's a whole different ballgame. I mean, we we the Bruins finally got to a point where they have more good young players than they can put on the ice at one time, and that is a blessing. And it is, you know, a quote unquote good problem to have. So I am all for the Bruins dipping, keyword dipping, into their prospect pool and future draft pick cachet to acquire a guy who can help them for this year's playoff run. But when it comes to moving, you know, multiple first round picks and a second round pick and a roster player to go out and get one guy. I mean, that just that doesn't make it doesn't make sense. Getting I, I, I was very proud of, of this line, by the way, that I ended my most recent article with. But trading all of that for Ryan McDonough 
is a great way to win the Stanley Cup this year. And holding on to all of those picks and talented prospects is a great way to win multiple Stanley Cups. Yeah. You have to think about the potential of the future while also trying to gauge where your team's at now. So you have to, like you said, dip into the prospect pool. But don't trade. Anytime you trade away a roster player, you're not helping your team, especially on, uh, no. at least at least on this team, this Bruins especially, team. Especially, especially a roster, a, a, a roster player as part of a team that is just like on fire. Also, like both this, players that have been mentioned, Carlo and DeBrus, they're 21 years old. Yeah, come on, it's not happening. It's just, it's just not happening. Which means that Ryan McDonough isn't happening. Which means that Rick Nash isn't happening. Which means that I'm totally fine with the Bruins not acquiring either of those guys. But if the Bruins, like hypothetically, wanted to offer a conditional first round pick or a conditional second round pick, rather that turns into a first round pick, if the Bruins make it to the Stanley Cup Finals, and say Austin Zarnick, and say. Uh, I don't know, a, a, a future second round pick or, you know, another prospect that isn't, you know, Donato, DeBrusque, Bjork, Riley Carlo, Heinen, whatever. Yeah. If the Bruins wanted to do that to go after, you know, uh, Michael Grabner or Michael Grabner and Nick Holden, you know, yeah. if the Bruins wanted to in one trade with one team shore up their forward and their defensive depth, I'm all about it. 100% do it. You've already you've got so many prospects you can afford to part with one, um, but you know, I'm, I feel like I'm talking in circles at this point. I just, I just, uh, as much as I love the NHL trade deadline and I and the prognostication and the projections and all of that, the the things that the things that people take as gospel because somebody tweeted it out, um, you know, it's 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 a little frustrating at times. It is. <laughs> So that's a good place to end it. <laughs> but uh, before yeah, I'm gonna do, go. I'm gonna go take a Xanax and smoke some crank. And before we do know. though, um, you know, Boston Herald writer Steve Harris just passed away. So yeah, just say we're thinking about him and his. Uh, you know, his yeah, family right and now. I, 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 I've always enjoyed Steve Harris's work. Uh, I've, you know, I have, you know, enjoyed reading his stuff as a fan for a long time, and you know, as a writer, I myself have have linked back to to many of his articles. Um, yeah, one of the games. Uh, it's too bad. Yeah. So, so uh, our our condolences to to the Harris family and to everybody close to him. Um, yeah. We we wish you uh, we wish you calm and and peace and uh, and acceptance and and all good things in 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 these trying times. All right. So you can find us on the uh, Hockey Writers Podcast page on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, on Grandstand Sports Network, the best view in sports. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you don't follow us on Twitter after 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 reaping the joy and the benefits of listening to this podcast, then you're not holding up your end of the bargain. Please, in this awful day and age where Twitter followers actually count for something, follow us on Twitter. We would really appreciate it. I always love when I see, like, I got a follower on Twitter, then I check the Twitter account for the, the podcast, which is TAB Pod on Twitter, and then I see a, someone followed us there, too, and I was like, oh, good. That means they actually listened and they looked for us. Yeah, exactly. So please, be one of those people. We like those people. And uh, beyond that, I don't have anything uh, except for uh, USA, USA, USA. That's all. Yeah, sorry, I'm not going to give you a bigger response. You're going Canada. down, Canada. <laughs> you're going. To, you actually, you're, let's be honest. You're probably not going down, but we can hope that you're going down. I mean, you can hope. <laughs> Shut Everybody up. else All right. listening to the show can can hope. <laughs> All <laughs> right, we're out of here for real this time. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.